I appreciate you having me uh, here today. Uh, I run a HubSpot agency in Houston called Baird Bradford. We're a diamond partner. And our focus really is on sales. And I wanted to ask before I begin, uh, how many people in the room are HubSpot agency partners? Just a show of hand. Good, we've got a few of you. Uh, how many of you would say that you are primarily focused on sales in your work? Show of hands. Good. And how many of you are in the trenches day-to-day -day working in the HubSpot platform? Good. So for those of you who are in the trenches working in HubSpot, how many of you have had uh, a, an experience of uh, unparalleled joy and satisfaction with the way the sales force takes those leads that you've generated and lovingly nurtured and converts them into closed sales. How many have had just a fabulous experience with that? <laughs> Noticing a distinct absence of hands. Well, my purpose this morning is to share with you some thoughts about the way to use the tool set that you already have, whether you're in sales, whether you're in marketing, whether you uh, uh, run a HubSpot agency, to make sure that you've done everything you can do to get ROI from the company's investment in the platform and in the people who use it. So if you, if you take nothing else away from my comments this morning, I want you to think about that there are, there are just some different ways to use the very same set of tools that you use every day in order to improve the rate at which sales uh, utilizes the platform and improve the close rate on the leads that you generate in marketing and most importantly, improve the satisfaction with the people who write the checks to make sure that you have a platform to keep working on. And at any time, if you have a question, please feel free to raise your hand. And I will save a little bit of time for Q&A as we get towards the end. And I'll ask Cluid, if you don't mind, uh, as we approach um, you know, 15 minutes until the end, please raise the flag. So um, I always like to start a talk with some cheerful statistics. By the way, you know that 65% of all statistics are made up on the spot. Were you aware of that? <laughs> Thank you. I heard a loud laugh somewhere. You'll get your prize. So this is my favorite one right here. And I apologize. I know the colors are hard to read, so I'm going to read it to you. What that says is 70% of managers uh, who expect their, staff, expect their staff to be cynical about using a CRM. Does this resonate with anybody? Yes, there we go. 50% of CRM projects fail due to slow user adoption, and only 46% achieve success defined as adoption rates at over 90%. So the title of my talk was a little bit of a bait and switch, right? Uh, how to get a CRM that sales actually wants to use. Well, the point is it's a great tool, but you have to work on the environment and on the salespeople and on your business processes in order for them to want to adopt the technology. So let's talk a little bit more about how you overcome these challenges. Because HubSpot people are trained to work in personas, we have ginned up the idea of a user persona. So I want you to take a minute and read this. This is an actual, uh, a real live, true to life case history in my own company. Uh, Raymond the Resistor wrote an email to his boss when he was introduced to HubSpot. And if you can't see in the back, I guess I'll read it. Today I spent time in HubSpot and I have to admit the software is impressive. It's intuitive, it's easy to follow. Uh, I created a contact and navigated around for different features within HubSpot. I created a lead and was glad to see that HubSpot picked up all of the activities 
and then uh, the contacts that I had around the lead, and that lead turned into a win last Friday. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? I mean, what more can you ask for? The, the user hops right in, puts a few bits of information in, boom, has a closed one sale. However, it will be very difficult for me to switch to HubSpot. I've been developing leads and Outlook for many years. For someone starting new, HubSpot can be a great tool, but for someone who has tools that are working, it'll be a tough switch. And you know what, boss? We would create more value if we would just focus our attention on being responsive to customers. I mean, how about that for a shot, right? You, 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 boss, don't know what you're doing making us salespeople waste time on this CRM. You're actually taking us away from our valuable duties by having us focus our attention on HubSpot. Does this story sound familiar to anybody? Show of hands. This is the most common uh, user persona that I've seen in our practice. Is people who express willingness to try, but at the end of the day, uh, they just know that they can do their work better uh, if they do it the old way. The real problem in this situation was that the sales manager simply had no tools or competency for dealing with this objection. And so he came to us and said, look what I'm dealing with. Somebody who used the system and, and had a good outcome but they still don't want to use it. I'm pulling my hair out. What do I do? So that's what kind of got us off on this journey of really taking a look at the, the flywheel, at the inbound marketing approach, at the service level agreement between sales and marketing, for those of you who are familiar with that construct, and really trying to figure out what's it going to take for marketing to be able to successfully deliver ROI on marketing investments when your fate is in the hands of the salespeople who take those leads that you're generating. How do we do that? So I've boiled this down into th uh, uh, three C's, and uh, I must confess that I have trouble remembering the three C's, and so I won't blame you if you have trouble as well. But I've repeated them to myself over and over and over, and I'm hoping that they're sticking. Convenience, competence, and community. And I'm going to step through each one of these things. Um, there is a HubSpot user blog post coming out, supposed to have been out by now, coming out in uh, December, that goes through these issues as well. I've been working with uh, HubSpot Academy on this topic. And, of course, you'll receive a link to the presentation. And I want to tell you that there are lots of links embedded in the presentation to tools and materials and blog posts. So if, if I go through a lot of things quickly, when you receive this, you'll be able to go through yourselves and find the reference material that I think will help illustrate some of these points. And before I go too much further... Let me say this. Adoption is not a black and white issue. First of all, it's different in every company. So in your company, you have to decide the hurdle for adoption. What does it mean to have achieved it? And then once you've established that hurdle and you've gotten alignment around what adoption means, you can look at these three C's, these three areas, and it's not like you have to do them all. It's really more a case where each incremental thing you do will show benefit. So it's a journey, and you can pick your battles. So I really, if you take, uh, again, if you take something away from today, it would be, as you see what I'm putting up here, think of one thing out of this list that you want to try today or tomorrow that is easily within reach for you to get an early victory and make that happen. And then another one and another one. It doesn't have to be everything. The important point is set your objective for adoption and then begin working. So convenience. 
Convenience really is made up of three parts. And when I use the word convenience, it's really about how easy is it, how good of a user experience is it uh, for the salespeople. And by the way, this applies to Marketing Hub or Service Hub and the users, whether they're salespeople or not. But I'm focused on the sales experience because they're the ones who tend to feel like the CRM is something they're being forced to do in addition to their real job as opposed to doing their work inside of the platform. And that's that fundamental mindset change that we really are pursuing. So the three elements of convenience, the first one is frictionless selling. How many of you have heard the term frictionless selling? Good. There's a HubSpot certification on this. I would strongly urge you in marketing to get that certification so that you can begin to talk the language of sales in an inbound uh, uh, business process environment. The second piece is intrinsic design, and the third is implementation. So let me go through what these things mean. Uh, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on the frictionless selling framework because there's a ton of information in HubSpot Academy about it. It's a way of rethinking sales to reduce uh, the amount, uh, uh, sorry, to reduce friction and create more convenient experiences. So those are the keywords. How, how do you set up your sales process so that the experience is more convenient for both buyers and sellers. If you're in marketing, you may not feel that this is within your purview, but I would argue that if you educate your sales force about how frictionless selling works, about how enabling sales reps really is about reducing the uh, useless tasks that they get caught up in and using automation to make it easier for them to avoid uh, the, uh, you know, the, the redundant kind of boring manual labor that they need to do. These are things that no one is going to resist doing. You as the HubSpot expert can bring uh, workflow automation to the sales side and, and begin to get them to understand how frictionless selling is going to make their lives better. As I said, there is a certification, uh, and I highly recommend it. Um, the second piece is alignment, and the third is to transform the process. Here's the takeaway from this. If you want to learn more about frictionless selling, which is really, again, uh, how to take the work processes that sales are doing. It's not their selling methodology, but it's how they do their actual work. Um, there are three tools, free tools available for you uh, in HubSpot. There's a sales rep efficiency audit, and this is a tool you use in the enable phase, right? You're basically looking to identify wasted motion. What can you take away that'll make them happy, that will save time without interfering with the final deliverable? The second tool, uh, which is about aligning the sales process with the buying process, crazy idea, right? Um, the, it's a buyer mapping tool, so you can simply help the salespeople understand the buyer journey, and then you on the marketing side, when you're doing sales enablement, making sure you've got the content and the materials that align to the buying process, and that sales understands how to utilize and deploy those materials uh, so that everything is in alignment, and how to use sequences and workflow automation to make it easier for salespeople how many of you have never used a sequence? So sequences and sequence cues, wonderful tool for making salespeople's lives easier. Just go and look those up and you'll have an aha moment. And then finally, there's even a bit here for management. It's the sales coaching scorecard uh, to help uh, lead sales management down the path of enlightenment about uh, frictionless selling. And so I would highly recommend just taking a look at these tools and uh, trying to have a meeting with sales where you engage them in the process of making the sales process more frictionless, partly by engaging marketing and helping with 
collateral and automation and, and the other sales enablement tools. Any questions about this? So again, it's important to understand, even if you just learn about this and share the information with sales and let them begin to consume it, and spend time with sales introducing them to the automations that are available, you've already made a big leap forward in driving adoption. And that's the end game. They will, upon finding a tool that they love that really works, they will keep using it. Yes, there are other structural things that have to be in place, and let me digress for just a moment. It is true that in, I would say, 90% of the CRM implementations that my firm has done, the uh, sales management has had to tell sales, if the deal isn't in the CRM, it doesn't exist. If it doesn't exist, it won't get fulfilled, and you won't get your commission. There are flavors of that. You'll only get half commission, whatever. That's the stick approach. And, you know, I think there's a role for that, but it isn't sufficient. And so I'm not averse to taking that path, but you need to provide the rest of the context, which is really what this presentation is covering with the three C's. So the nice thing about frictionless selling is it's a HubSpot methodology. It's built in. And it relates to intrinsic design. Intrinsic design is really kind of an academic term. Just think of it as, you know, made smart. HubSpot has a lot of features already built into it that drive user adoption. And so I, they're a little hard to see on the bottom. The four that I like to draw attention to, first one is sales intelligence. When I do a demo of HubSpot for salespeople, the very first tool I go to is the prospects tool. How many of you have used the prospects tool? So if you want to make a, if you want to make a friend in sales, go sit down and open up the prospects tool and ask them if any of their target accounts are in the list of companies, anonymous visitors to the website. It is, if, if, you, if you get lucky and one of their target accounts is there, you're, you're home free. All of a sudden, they're saying, wait, uh, you know, uh, British Petroleum had, be, has been to our website. I'm, I, I have three people that I call on, and they're in the CRM, but who is that? And you suddenly see a pattern of activity in the prospects tool. Salespeople aren't accustomed to looking at this kind of data, so it's a valuable function of marketing to help them analyze prospects data and contact data and activity data on the contact timeline. It, it's, it is much more productive when you have an MQL that you're handing over to sales if you take the time to really walk through the data for each one of those prospects so that they can internalize and understand and learn the process by which you evaluated those leads. Uh, so prospect identification and then the automatic contact enrichment. Of course, you know this HubSpot Insights fills out all that company information on the left-hand side of the contact pane. The second area of sales acceleration is the email tracking and the document tracking. Salespeople love to see when their emails have been opened, and you just need to reinforce that behavior. Teach them to read the contact timeline, to click on those little drop-downs so they see all the bits and pieces, get them asking questions about it. I think the more time you spend as a marketing person educating the salespeople about prospect behavior within HubSpot, the, the bigger the adoption payoff is going to be. Because again, they are not accustomed to seeing this kind of data. We, we weren't accustomed to seeing it until we got HubSpot or an equivalent platform, right? So we can't just assume that the salespeople know what that is and know how to use it. The third area is the automation, sequences, smart lists, task reminders. Uh, there's a, a tremendous opportunity there to bring uh, sales process automation. You don't have to dump it in all at once. Strongly recommend having regular meetings between sales and marketing. It'd be once a month, 
where you take a look at how the workflow happens through sales and identify opportunities to uh, help them put automations in place. And then the last one, of course, is mobility. It's very hard to find a CRM with a great mobile app, but if you can help them figure out the right use case for the HubSpot mobile app, uh, I think they will, they will grow to figure out what its role is in their work process. So intrinsic design simply means you're using a CRM that was built for ease of use. And then finally, and I, I really cannot overstate the importance of this, it is how you plan and deploy your implementation of HubSpot with adoption as a goal. So adoption really begins on day one when you put a cross-functional team together to plan the goals and objectives for the company as a result of having implemented HubSpot. And, and having the adoption metrics stated and having the senior executives uh, agree that those metrics are appropriate and agree that they will go on record stating that this is essential to the company. It's like so many corporate initiatives. Unless you have senior executive buy-in, you're going to flounder. And so once you have the context set uh, with a leadership team that is supporting this and will communicate regularly about the process of the implementation and when it's deployed about its use, then you begin to look at the next level of issues to address. Data quality is number one. If you are migrating from, it doesn't matter whether it's another CRM or from spreadsheets or post-it notes on the desk, uh, data quality is essential. There are a lot of decisions to be made about what data to pull forward. And, and I've seen it over and over again where people just sort of say, well, we need to move all of the data from, you know, ACT, our desktop version from 1998, right up into HubSpot. Uh, we need all that historical data there. Never mind that uh, when you run their contact database through uh, Kickbox or one of the verification services, the number of good emails drops by 85%. That it's a hard talk that you need to have with them about the plan for migrating data. How are you going to get clean, reliable data at startup? If you're doing integrations, making sure those things are syncing correctly, having testing, doing it with a pilot group and rolling it out. There are a tremendous number of practices in implementation. We have an ebook. Uh, it's 56 pages that goes through all these issues. It's free. It's on the HubSpot Marketing Resource Library, so you can go there and download it. Um, data quality, if your salespeople get on HubSpot and they start looking for their contacts and the information isn't there in the right fields in the right order, they're going to reject it. And all that hard, it, your job just got to be much harder. Uh, User-led design, this is really about having a, a, a cross-functional team deciding what the user experience is going to be like, what are the functional requirements. If the CFO owns your CRM, which happens in many cases when the CRM is hanging off of an ERP implementation, you're going to get one kind of CRM. If the marketing people own the CRM, you're going to get another kind of CRM. Uh, you need to have all those functions at the table and make good decisions that serve everyone's needs. Uh, and so having the users define the functional requirements and then map the business processes that is the second critical factor. And then the final critical factor is the customization that you do. How many of you are familiar with the HubSpot app marketplace? So the app marketplace gets bigger literally every day. There are, there are software apps. I, I read a statistic not too long ago. The average uh, corporation uses something like 90 pieces of sales and marketing software standalone apps. Those are increasingly being made available in the HubSpot app marketplace, and they can be integrated with HubSpot. So the more tools that people are already using that you integrate with your business process as you've designed it in HubSpot, the more convenient and frictionless the experience is going to be. So you have marketplace apps, and then you can use 
CRM extensions to do customization. How many of you are familiar with CRM extensions? Yeah, so I would urge you to go read about CRM extensions. This is a way to give your users a window in the timeline to external data sources. Uh, it makes it, again, simpler and faster for them to do the work that they need to get done. Here's an example of a customization. So the app in the app marketplace is called Orgchart Hub. How many of you have heard of Orgchart Hub? I, I work a lot in B2B, and our uh, strategic account salespeople want to develop an organizational chart to know all the people that they're selling to, who's involved in the decision process. Org Chart Hub is a great tool, integrates with HubSpot. So here on the right-hand side, if when you install it, you'll see a little window for Org Chart Hub, and you simply click on it, and that spawns an organizational chart right inside HubSpot that the salesperson can build for that account. So this is, a, I mean, people love this when they see it because it's like, oh, wow, I don't have to go into PowerPoint and make that anymore, and I don't have to switch back and forth. It just pops right up, and it's a different uh, organizational chart for each client. So I just give this in a, as an example of a CRM extension that happens to be connected to an app marketplace app. So it's kind of two birds in one stone. But you can custom build CRM extensions to point into an internal database that you might have. It's just a way of letting HubSpot interact with some external data. Happy to talk about that more afterwards if anybody is curious. All right, on to the second C. How am I doing on time, Clued? You're fine. All right. 15 minutes. All right, oh, not that fine. So competence, fancy word. Uh, it does not mean the same thing as training. It, it is more about learning and skills development. So I, I don't know about you guys. I was a terrible student. And I, I, I was not a conventional learner. I, you know, I, I, I could not sit in a classroom and listen to someone lecture and be focused. I needed to learn at my own pace. And this is emblematic of adult learning. You need to meet people where they are in order for them to acquire skills. And training and skills development are related, but they're not the same thing. So you can have a training program, but I'm actually not addressing training here when I talk about competence. Because it's assumed that you have training. And it's assumed that you have made HubSpot Academy available to people. Here are the things that you do in addition to training in order to help your users learn and acquire skills. So the first one is onboarding, the second is mentoring, and the third is certifications. So onboarding is day one. When you flip the switch, you go live, and everybody is ready to jump in and start working. Early wins are critical. Like I said a minute ago with uh, data quality and getting things deployed, it all has to be working, it all has to be functioning, you can't have any stumbling blocks. But when you begin, it's critical that your executive leadership reinforce the why. Why are we doing this? Why are we either starting to have a CRM or making this change to using a CRM? What are the benefits of the company? Uh, and also, what's in it for you? So we like to talk about frictionless switching, right? We had frictionless selling. Frictionless switching is about connecting their prior experience to the new tools. So when you have somebody who's taken the training, the problem with HubSpot training is it's just, here's how you use these functions. It doesn't say, when you were working in Salesforce, the way you converted a lead was like this. This is done in HubSpot this way. That connection is critical to adult learning because you have a whole pattern of thinking that you're having to rewire in order to get people to switch. So we think about this idea of frictionless switching as developing your onboarding so that the most typical 
changes that they have to make are tied back to the old way of doing things and made very clear about the new way of getting those things done. Everybody got that? Is that yes. we tracking here? All right, good. Um, like I said earlier, the integrations that you've installed have to be working. Data, documents migrated, you know, and your support system has to be up and running. You, you, if you don't have some kind of an internal help desk or some resource that people can go to when they have the inevitable questions, the most important time to answer questions and to make people feel like they are competent is at the very beginning when they start using the tool. If you don't, they will figure out, they'll find bad habits, they will just not do it. So being available to support them on onboarding is crucial. And by the way, the whole idea of onboarding is simply get the basics there so that they can do the essential functions. You know, how do you enter a lead? How do you update a company record? Those sorts of things. Just the major high level stuff. Then you can get into training and competence building later. And then finally, the what's in it for me, communicating to them. And again, we like the prospects tool for this, the sales intelligence and the contact timeline. But the magic is you, if you can get away with this in your company, you tell your sales users when you reach a certain level of competence, when you've demonstrated you know how to use the tools at a basic level, we will give you leads. Until you've shown competence, we're not going to send leads to you. We're going to route them to the people who have learned. And you'll probably get some kickback from that. But having leads is really the most power that you have in sales. Does it make sense? So marketing, use your power wisely. <laughs> Mentoring, not every, not every company is going to have a culture that lends itself to this. But if you think about your own businesses, there are, the chances are pretty good. There's somebody in there who is a, a natural teacher, a natural helper, somebody who would like to have the role of mentoring others in using the tool. And so there's lots of ways towards a mentoring program. And the bigger the organization, I think the easier it is to do something like this. Um, but I would say that even in a small organization, a HubSpot user group uh, can be a great place to find mentoring. In our hug, we run lots of just roundtable discussions, and it's like group mentoring where people are helping each other. So um, if you can find a way to have mentoring for not every user, but the ones who really want to get going with this tool, it will pay off, it will pay off uh, wonderfully. And again, these blue line things are links, so you can click through when you receive the presentation and, and get those blog posts and background. Finally, uh, certifications. I, uh, these are the four certifications in HubSpot Academy that I'd suggest taking a look at. And I know the idea of a salesperson getting certifications may seem kind of crazy, but if you talk to the sales manager and you're able to... Uh, get the sales manager to reward and recognize salespeople for getting certifications, then you have some built-in uh, motivation there. There are also a set of lessons in HubSpot Academy if somebody's not willing to weigh in uh, on the full certification. So this link there will take you to a search that I've pre-filtered that will show you all these lessons uh, for how to how to work in HubSpot. So you can immediately give people some, you know, 30-minute to one-hour lessons that they can go try and do on their own if they're interested. The final C is community. Uh, HubSpot is really, I think, a tremendous community in and of itself. I think this is especially true on the agency partner side. Um, the three elements of community are communication, support, and recognition. And again, there are tools available to you already to support these efforts. So communication is simple. It's about reinforcing the desired behaviors. How many of you use Slack or Microsoft Teams in your company? So have you set up a channel related to HubSpot, using HubSpot? 
strongly recommend it. Get somebody to moderate it, maybe one of your mentors. And it becomes a safe place to ask questions. And uh, you, you can also uh, uh, get your managers to talk about what they like, about what they're seeing in the CRM. Uh, and users can ask the community in Slack for help solving problems. So this is a tremendous channel to use to communicate uh, at all levels of the organization the benefits of the CRM. Uh, anybody using Service Hub? So Service Hub, and really any help desk, but if you already have Service Hub and you're using it for clients, you can use it internally for yourself to let your users put in tickets and provide a help desk. So it's kind of there waiting, and you can build a knowledge base and FAQs and all those things. There is no reason that your organization should be any different uh, in how it uses HubSpot compared to using any other piece of software. You need support uh, to help them uh, solve problems and be able to use the system. And then finally, in terms of recognition, um, if you have sales professional, you have some pretty good reporting there. Um, what I've circled here, uh, if you're an admin, how many are admin in your HubSpot portal? So I don't know if you've noticed or if they've enabled it here in your market, but you can go in and look at your users, and it now shows you a last active date for all of your users. So you can see if somebody has been on in the last few seconds or not since 1989. And you, you, that's very powerful information, and you have to be careful how you use it. Uh, but it's a breakthrough. It's the first time HubSpot has provided any such information. Uh, there's an engagements report that will kind of give you a sense for what the salespeople are doing. And then you can export your data into Tableau or Power BI or Clipfolio to begin building reports. We are actually uh, building a user adoption dashboard, and I was talking to Cluid. We'll, we're looking for a few companies who want to be part of a closed beta of our user adoption scorecard. And so if anybody has any interest in that, uh, please feel free to see me after the, uh, after the day. And then finally, gamification uh, will help with your recognition. There's a couple that are already available in the HubSpot uh, uh, app marketplace. And so that's it. Um, the three areas, convenience, competence, community. HubSpot has tools in virtually every part of its platform. You just think a little differently about how you use them and factor it into your planning and deployment and ongoing management and you will have a significant impact on user adoption. And I can tell you that we do all of these things with, we do some of these things with all of our clients to the degree that they have an appetite for it, and it does work. Any questions? Did I successfully put you all to sleep? My thick accent too much for you? I, I, I've got one for you, John. Because um, we also deal with the, the marketing and the sales and, and the mix of the two. What's the kickback that you're actually seeing in most organizations? Do you actually find a real resistance from the salespeople f from implementing CRM systems, or, or do they generally see it as a positive thing? Well, so you all probably have an image of what Texans are like. And we do a lot of work in the oil and gas industry, and we were at a meeting about the CRM with one client, and... The, one of the sales guys leaned back in his chair and he said, these fat fingers will never type on a CRM. <laughs> and so you, kind of, you know where you stand there. And you, you know, you, you, there's no arguing about it. There's just slowly beginning to chip away at by working on the environment. So that's a case where uh, if it's not in the CRM, it doesn't exist. You know, you have to have the crutch taken away, and the sales management has to have the willingness uh, to show all the salespeople why this is a necessary part of their job. Because it's not appropriate for outright uh, refusal in a business environment. You know, uh, and, and so 
we have to find a way to have some open dialogue about this and really get down to what their concerns are. And then we can begin to work at it. But it is really more of a consultative activity, I think. And we actually have a coach that we bring in on occasion from a, a firm that does culture change. And I can tell you for that, every one guy with no you know, fat fingers, there's 20 more who feel the same way. And so in circumstances like that, it can be a cultural issue. What, one of the guys that you had, I'll come back, just to finish off a point that you raised at the beginning there, um, he was talking about Outlook, and he said, I'm never going to go away from Outlook, right? Is it acceptable to let him stay in Outlook for a while? Because you can do a lot of HubSpot sales stuff within the Outlook tool. Yeah, we, we encourage people to uh, use Outlook as long as it's integrated. Yeah. That's fine, but you won't be able to take advantage of the automation tools. You have to go into HubSpot to run sequence. So the key is getting them to see why the alternatives are better, and it takes time and working with them to get them to do that. But, the, yeah, the, the switch, it's almost like letting Outlook integrate or Gmail is a mixed blessing, right? Because it, it kind of sustains the problem. Training wheels. Training wheels, yes. You had a question? Do you have any information or stats on how users of HubSpot have integrated this application with um, LinkedIn Salesforce Navigator and whether or not that's been successful for them in running you know, campaigns and generating leads? So I do not. Um, I think we have a lot of pushback from clients on the cost of Salesforce Navigator. Uh, that's just in our part of the business. Does anybody have any thoughts about that? Do you have an answer to the question? No. Yeah, we've got quite a lot of experience with Sales Navigator and there's no pushback whatsoever about uh, the cost of Sales Navigator that we experience. Uh, the sales guys love it, they go to it, they don't need a big stick to go to Sales Navigator, completely the opposite of going for a CRM system because it's so valuable to them. Uh, and organizations tend to give out licenses for Sales Navigator very easily you know, to, to their staff, in our experience, in London. But it is the professional level of sales navigator is not just the base one that you, you, you need in order to get the integration with, with HubSpot, yeah, I think. So that there, is, there is cost associated with that. Get the money back very quickly from sales navigator. There is such value in it. Yeah. Good. Yes. Yeah, are we just trying to... Uh, I, I agree I'll, I'll repeat the question. I, I think maybe have a, have a chat with, with John um, offline to talk about that. We, we, we've got lots of different strategies around, around LinkedIn and, and different ways of, 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 of working HubSpot alongside LinkedIn. Yeah, there's also some third-party tools which have some dubious um, capabilities to, to integrate as well, and you've got to be a little careful about that because if you automate the process, you can actually get bounced from LinkedIn and you can lose your LinkedIn account. So, um, you know, if you've got, you know, 10, 20,000 contacts in LinkedIn, you really don't want to lose that. You're raising really a very important issue, which is HubSpot within the context of all the other data sources and tools that are available. And, and I would really urge uh, anybody in marketing uh, to become conversant in the major ones. And I think Sales Navigator is one. But just integrations, even custom API development and how that works, the, the faster you become uh, able to talk about that and find resources to make that happen, the, the, the better your adoption is going to be and the more satisfied the sales team will be. It's all about generating leads and making them more efficient, and there will be an appetite for those tools. In, in terms of that, one of the things that we found quite successful, um, if we go in and we implement HubSpot and we start doing onboarding and training and everything else, is not to look at HubSpot as a single piece of code, but to actually look at the entire tech stack. And you go in, and there's, you know, LinkedIn is an obvious one, but things like Pandadoc for, for the sales guys. Um, th there's probably five or six different pieces of software that you can get up and running 
quite quickly, which give value back to the business quite quickly. Oh, I'll tell you my personal favorite, SIG Parser, S-I-G-P-A-R-S-E-R. -S -E Anybody ever hear of that one? It's in the app marketplace. What it does is it goes into your uh, email archive, like an outlook at your PST file, and it will go back as far as you want. Uh, you can go back five years, and it will read every email and look for email signatures at the bottom of the email. And it will take those, it'll parse those out, and it will load them into your Outlook address book, which otherwise you have to do manually, and it will sync them into HubSpot. So if you need to populate your CRM with people who you have had email interaction with, uh, this is a tremendous tool. It's very inexpensive. It's like $8 a month, and it'll keep it constantly updated. So it's a, it's a salespeople pleaser. <laughs> Interestingly enough, that functionality is then being rolled out into HubSpot itself, into the core product. Oh, well, yeah. there you go. So, but, but, it, but it doesn't retrofit. It doesn't go back, so you still need to, to get that. Okay, one last question. Yes? Just more of a practical one. The complaints I have these days is spending too much time. So as, as a decision I need to take, is do, do I really force it that they have to be the information in throughout the day, or do we pay for another half an hour or early on the day or end of the day to feed in the so the question is the, the, the balance of administrative overhead for a sales team compared to getting the job done and actually just selling stuff, right? It's the classic. Yeah. <laughs> so, it de so it depends on uh, what you are doing the CRM for. If you are trying to make it feed into your invoicing system and you're asking salespeople to do that kind of clerical work, I can see that they would resist. I think it's a, it is a good idea to ask for certain kinds of information just in time, right? Only when it's needed. For example, you get a, a lead to ask salespeople to input every piece of information about the company. At that point, it may be a waste of time because that lead may not be qualified. But when there's a deal... Maybe that's, you know, when the deal has reached a certain level of maturity in the process, maybe that's the time to require more pieces of information. So you get them to do more work as the opportunity becomes closer to close one. You can tie the actual fields requirements to the deal stages so that as you move a deal from one stage to another, the salesperson has to fill in a certain amount of information in order for it to move on. Um, and that's a good way of enforcing that type of, 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 of clarity. Okay, I think we're going to pause here now. I'll hand over to Edwin. So please, thanks to John. Thank you. Thanks.